How do you think the labor movement has changed in these times of economic uncertainty in this country when there are so many guys and so many women who don't have jobs because of the sorry state of the economy right now? Well, I would say the labor movement hasn't changed basically from the demands made on employers such as the union security, vacations, holidays, fringes, wages, hours, and seniority. But since, ninth, since the World War II and with the employment ratio that we've had, more or less you haven't had to fight scabs, which I have predicted and always said that no employer ever accepts a union, tolerates it. And at the very minute he gets a surplus of labor, he will immediately do what they're doing in Florida today, cut the wages, get more productivity, and generally abuse labor. Do it not recommend that you reduce what it took years to get, because it'll take you years to recapture it. Mm -hmm. As they cut the budget, as inflation erodes away, the taxpayers, the tax amount of money they get, they'll want to take something else away. And ultimately, they will lose what it took the last 10 years to get. Next will be the pension as they're now trying to do in Detroit. Uh, next will be the question of giving up uh, three days. And it just doesn't work out. So Nixon relied on Fitzsimmons to be, in effect, a kind of uh, on a grand level, a scab, yeah. a, a, a class trader, if you want to, uh, like a commander, a scab commander, uh, specifically on what was called the Free Board, which was the President's Executive Concentrated Board for Wage and Price Controls, and this was the, the wage side. In order to handle inflation, as the public demanded, Nixon tried to assemble a presidential board of labor union leaders who would agree on smaller wage increases so as to not drive through a wage price spiral. Right. And wage increases are just met by price increases by the business yeah. and lower the rate of inflation. So and, for, and at least in theory, doing some kind of price control on the other side. Yeah, in theory. Right. You know, Nixon, and in actuality at first, but yeah. he, he really didn't like doing that. Right. Richard, we are all Keynesians now. Yeah. Nixon. So while other unions were advocating for higher wages to meet inflation, Fitzsimmons was becoming the most reliable vote at all for Nixon's schemes to kind of compress the wages and squeeze them so that they fell behind inflation. And he wanted this especially to happen with transportation workers because that's where goods can get most tied up mm. as pretty much everyone realized during COVID. Yes. The, scheme to do this centered on the pay board, which had the authority to approve or disapprove of the collective bargaining agreements won by strikes or bargaining by the union. And I, I think there's a pretty stark example of how Fitzsimmons kind of became Nixon's stooge or pawn on this pay board, because at one point, all the other board members, all the upper labor leaders, even like George Meany, who was like, yeah. Also, a you know, firm anti-communist, yeah, pro-Vietnam yeah. War. Like he, he also walked out mm -hmm. when the Nixon administration demanded that the wage board halt a settlement that was won by Harry Bridges Longshoremen's Union yeah. on the West Coast. Harry Bridges and the Longshoremen, the same ones that Hoffa wanted to make an alliance with and almost did make an alliance yeah. with before he started getting indicted. Mm -hmm. But Fitzsimmons did not walk out. Fitzsimmons stayed and voted against the wage settlement. Uh, and this made Fitzsimmons kind of the most reliable labor leader as far as Nixon was concerned. But Fitzsimmons had something he needed from Nixon, and that was to somehow get Hoffa out of jail, which he could do as president by commuting or pardoning Hoffa. And he needed Hoffa out of jail to appease... The membership. The membership, yes. Who were ready to... Like yeah. basically cut his throat. Yeah. Now, this didn't stop Nixon from extorting mm -hmm. Fitzsimmons and probably Hoffa as well. Purportedly, Hoffa, when he heard that there could be a deal through intermediaries to get him a pardon, paid uh, Nixon's uh, committee to reelect the president with money from Alan Dorfman in Chicago, who was minding his like kind of like shadow bank accounts. 
Uh, to me, this seems likely as the only known payment to Nixon flunkies and stooges uh, appears to be made by Charles O'Brien on behalf of Frank Fitzsimmons. And this was recounted in Charles O'Brien's own adopted son, Jack Goldsmith's memoir, In Hoffa's Shadow. Mm -hmm. And in this account... These adopted sons are trouble. I swear. Writing memoirs. In, uh, <laughs> in Jack Goldsmith's account, O'Brien tells him that what happened was this. O'Brien was called up sometime in 1971 when the deal was getting finalized with Nixon to pardon Hoffa. He goes to the Teamsters headquarters in Washington on Fitzsimmons's direct orders and instruction and picks up a suitcase in the size and the weight of the suitcase in O'Brien's view as an experienced courier is about $1 million. Mm. And at first I said, this sounds like bullshit. Can you really fit $1 million in a like small briefcase? Yeah. And it turns out you absolutely can, oh, wow. especially if it's in $100 bills. Yeah. I thought I, I thought I'd heard, you know, I thought I heard some like myth, not myth busters, but myth busters type stuff being like, no way can you have a million dollars in a briefcase. But you know, they were never, they were never teamsters. They were not, what, what situation have they ever been in where they're walking around? Right, like, yeah, but they're just doing some dumb things. Chucky O'Brien, he might have been in a couple of situations where he's walking around yeah. Las Vegas with one million dollars siphoned off from various casinos yeah, for sure. to put into like God knows what like Rube Goldberg scheme. Yeah, to to you know sell swamp land in Florida. <laughs> and importantly, he was doing this for other people, and it wasn't one of his own dumbass schemes. Mm -hmm. So O'Brien picks up this briefcase. O'Brien then goes to deliver this briefcase to a prearranged room at the Mayflower Hotel, where he says he knocks on the door. There's a man in the dark, says, is that the case? Yes, hands the case, door closes, and he departs. And then, days later, Hoffa's pardon comes through. Mm -hmm. Did this come out during the Watergate stuff at all? So that seems it, like straightforward it, bribery. It does seem like straightforward bribery and extortion. Mm. Uh, the kind of convoluted way in which this might relate to what came out during Watergate is on what's the tape where John Dean, uh, Nixon's uh, counsel, one of Nixon from the Office of White House Legal Counsel, is talking to Nixon. And in Dean's account, he says he, he said, you know, there's a cancer growing on the presidency. We're having to pay all this hush money to these like, and goons and spooks and intelligence yeah. guys who we hired to do all this dirty work for us and to pay them it's going to cost a lot of money and then john dean says i think it would cost about a million dollars and nixon just immediately responds with yeah we can get that money mm. so, and the thought is maybe he knew that they could get that money because he had just received one million dollars yeah. so you didn't have a he didn't have a very good team of assassins because you just pay them lead the <laughs> The trick with this pardon, though, is that there is a special section that was added on for the benefit of Frank Fitzsimmons on there. Mm. So even though under the normal rules, Hoffa would be mandatorily, no bones about it, allowed to get out of prison in 1975 and take union office again, under this special commutation, he's let out now, but... He cannot participate in any union activity or take any officership until the year 1980. Mm. That clause was put in there, of course, for the benefit of Frank Fitzsimmons. So this million dollar payment isn't just, oh, I'm going to get Jimmy out of jail. It's I'm going to satisfy the union membership mm -hmm. who want Hoffa out of jail and shackle Hoffa. Yeah, secure my, my rule. And and Nixon is probably on board with it, too. Absolutely. And as Nixon noted on a tape conversation, quote, so you've got five more years restriction on him than he would have under the law. Mm. It's like, so this is how our evil scheme works, yeah. right? Good. I'm glad I said that on tape. Mm. But yeah, it's basically how it went. Now, with Hoffa out of prison and extremely angry that he can't participate in union activity, Charles O'Brien is sent, again, as the kind of observer, mm. consoler, and minder. And 
as he noted, Hoffa has callers and supporters coming to him all of the time um, saying that Fitzsimmons is a rat. He's selling us out. Mm. Provenzano is selling us out. And he begins doing interviews with TV and radio stations. Fitzsimmons, for his part, kind of concluding this closing of the deal, now that Hoffa's out of jail, but also barred from union politics, makes White House counsel Charles Colson the lead counsel for the Teamsters, mm. butting out Edward Bennett Williams' firm that skillfully defended Hoffa in his trials, and instead putting Nixon's lead, like, scumbag lawyer who eventually gets indicted and goes to prison. Yeah, yeah, Chuck Colson. Isn't he the one who became a big evangelical? Yes, yes, yeah. he is. Mm. A big figure in Naples, Florida, I learned. Mm. Not but... the best Naples. Anyway, go on. <laughs> So Hoffa still wants to take back control of his general presidency. He still wants to take the throne back. And at this time, he's actually raising money. People like Pete Camerata are like literally going around raising money for Hoffa Mm -hmm. to eventually campaign to take back the Teamsters. But he has this legal restriction. So in order to take back the Teamsters, Hoffa has to take care of three obstacles. One, he has to get that uh, pesky restriction put in there by Chuck Colson and, and Richard Nixon removed. Two, he has to actually get a position in a Teamsters local, like an officership in a Teamsters local, in order to qualify to run for the general presidency. And three, he has to have enough support among local officials, not just his local, but others, to win the presidency. And this is important because Part of the reason that the Teamsters is such like a patchwork empire is because like a lot of unions, including the UAW until recently, this recent election of uh, Sean Fain, um, there's, you can't just directly vote for the president. It's all indirect election by these officers, these chiefs of locals and so on. So Hoffa has to have enough support among An electoral college, if you will. An electoral college, if you will. And the Hoffa allies at this point are not the people who may have been Hoffa allies in the 50s and 60s. They're not the people who own big trucking concerns or just cutting deals. They are the people who are pissed off about the sellouts by Fitz, Fitzsimmons. They are the more people who are more sympathetic to the radicals. They're the Pete Camaradas on the ground. And old friend Harold Gibbons is back in the picture and he's friends with Hoffa again. Back in St. Louis. Back in St. Louis, Harold Gibbons, you might remember from our previous episodes, really fell out with Hoffa because Harold Gibbons thought it was a bad thing that John F. Kennedy has brains blown out. Yeah. And uh, that was enough of a line of disrespect for Hoffa mm-hmm. to kick him out of uh, the Marble House. The, restri- the one I want to know the most about is how's he going to get the restriction off? Do we have like a, are we going to talk about this later? I'm going to do a play-by-play of how he was about to get the restriction come, taken okay, off. Okay, okay. I will. Okay. But that is one obstacle. And the other obstacle, which Frank Fitzsimmons was very conscious of, is that Hoffa had to get a position in the local, which means he had to kind of control the local in order to run for the general presidency. Mm -hmm. Now, Dave Johnson, who is a Hoffa ally, is currently running the local, but also McMaster is also in there as a local official. And it's with this that there erupts a pretty bloody war in which McMaster's forces and just literal goons with, you know, organizer titles wage a campaign of terror against all the Johnson and Hoffa Mm. allies. And this all starts with the beating of a guy named Larry McHenry. And Larry, I learned is a, and this is one thing that Dan Moldea's book, The Hoffa Wars, is actually really good on, is this war in local 299. And it's an important terrain and I'm going to back up a little bit. This is one thing that Dan Moldea's book, The Hoffa Wars, is really good on is the war in Local 299 because it's a, it's very important terrain because even if like Hoffa doesn't run himself, maybe he runs a proxy like Harold Gibbons right. or Dave Johnson in. So the this core support of the, the kind of the Hoffa wing of the Teamsters has to be taken over by Fitzsimmons if right. he wants to keep Hoffa out. Yeah, it's not just, oh, you get rid of Hoffa or you get rid of, or or you keep him out. It's you need to suppress 
his base. Yeah. You, it's, need-, you need to win the hearts and minds, so to speak. Uh, though we'll see what that actually means in practice. It means what it usually means, <laughs> it turns out. And uh, yeah, this really like warfare by McMaster and Fitzsimmons starts out with the alleged beating of a guy named Larry McHenry. Now, Larry, little Larry, mm. is kind of the oddball in local 299. He considers himself a dissident, but he's like a one-man dissident. And he oh, yeah. publishes his own dissident newspaper Classic. himself called Watchdog. Oh, yeah. Mick, we all know the time. Yeah. Mick Henry uh, accuses Johnson of, Dave Johnson, the Hoffa ally of corruption, rigging elections, and so on. And to be anti-Johnson, he allies himself to Roland McMaster. Mm. Um, an honest man. And a real honest man. Like the guy who hasn't actually worked for anything other than beating the shit out of people. Yeah. And is just grimly staring at people in union meetings with one eye until they leave. Yeah. So McHenry, however, complaining about Dave Johnson's you know, regime so many times and how he, Dave Johnson's cooking the books, claimed that he walked out of a meeting one day and found himself set upon by three Teamsters members. Hmm. Uh, He very much publicized this claim, probably in his newsletter, Watchdog. (laughs) And shortly thereafter, um, according to Dan Moldea, two of the people he named died. And by died, I mean they were murdered. Otto Wendell, who was a Teamster official and pro-Johnson ally, also found that his barn, which actually had full-on farm animals yeah. in it, uh, was burned to the ground. Mm. And then later on in the newsletter, Watchdog, again, just published by Larry McHenry, said that, you know, it's very terrible that Wendell's farm burned down. But, you know, these things happen when you're as corrupt. <laughs> was Wendell was Wendell one of the guys who supposedly beat him up? No, but he was a friend of one of the guys who beat him up. Okay, all so part the, of that Johnson faction. Yeah. Okay, so the idea, so McHenry was trying to get across the idea that the Johnson people beat him up to quiet his dissidents. Correct. Okay, and then two of them. Got yeah, to, to quiet his pro McMaster, pro Fitzsimmons. Dissidents. Yeah, his quasi dissidents. Yeah, like, dissident two. Um, do we uh, were the were the cases ever solved on the two murders? No, but. One thing that did come out is that Larry McHenry to several Teamsters members and kind of hinted to Dan Moldea that he burned down Otto Wendell's oh, farm. Shit. As far as the two guys who were murdered, that seems more likely done by McMaster's yeah. more regular goons. Yeah. Now, on Labor Day 1971, uh, another pro Hoffa union official, James Cliff, finds three sticks of dynamite placed under his car. A few months later, three weeks after Hoffa's release, uh, a pro Hoffa official named Gene Page has his house bombed. Quote, the front of the house was blasted away and the aluminum front door was thrown 20 feet inside the house. Page was not home, but his wife was asleep on a couch near the front door. Somehow she escaped injury. The police investigated and told Page that a single stick of dynamite had been carefully planted and then detonated under the front steps of his house. But the pro Hoffa forces persisted uh-huh. and got more attacks. George Roxborough, a well, a pro Hoffa organizer with Local 299, was sitting in his car on the front of his girlfriend's house on Royal Oak in d- suburban Detroit. And as he recounted, we drove up the cir- inner circular driveway and then we were sitting there talking. One car pulled up in back of me and another car pulled up alongside. And I saw this guy in the red car pull up in the front seat fumbling around with something. There were three people in the car together and all I could see were shadows. And then the guy in the front fumbling around pulled out a shotgun. And the next thing I know, bang, I was hit. At least two blasts crashed through the windshield on the driver's side of the 1972 Cadillac that Roxborough was driving. And he was pretty gruesomely wounded mm-hmm. in the head, arms, and chest. And as he says, my eye actually came out of my head. Mm-hmm. So did, did uh, other than possibly beating up uh, McHenry, the watchdog, uh, did the did the pro office side, the pro Johnson side, get any licks in themselves? No, and that's actually something that even Dan Moldea emphasizes because mm-hmm. he is really anti-Hoffa himself. Yeah. 
is that all of the violence went one way. It was covered as being like a feud between factions, but it was really just McHenry's forces with no doubt funds and money yeah. coming out of the international I mean, headquarters. Forces. Yeah, sorry, that <laughs> mass, not not the forces of Watchdog. Yeah, uh, but yeah, the, he's his perception was that it was McMaster's forces and they would have basically like goons like laid up in hotels for mm. like weeks on end yeah stalking targets to try to pull off one of these like bumbling attacks like yeah, shooting yeah. George Roxborough with a shotgun and making his eyeball out uh Pete Camerata the warehouse worker actually saw this campaign up close and uh, noted this as happened to Dave Johnson himself at one point, McMaster and his goons came into the local 299 hall and attacked Johnson, breaking his leg. Johnson, fearing for his life, began to spend almost all his time in Florida and return to Detroit only once every three to four months to chair one of the monthly union meetings. But somebody, presumably one of McMaster's cronies, followed Johnson to Florida and blew up his boat. Mm. Not with Johnson on it. Not with Johnson on it. I mean, given what happened during like the whole shotgun incident where they're just like fumbling around yeah, with a shotgun and like can't the, quite get the shells in, then shoot the guys and I I feel like they're not the slickest operators. They're they're not the best trained soldiers, these yeah. guys. These are these are low grade goods. Yeah. And I think that's ultimately what makes the leadership search out, you know, put the word out that they need um, a higher quality of criminal. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh yeah, and they, they they know who to call. They know who to call. They know a guy. Now, the atmosphere is getting particularly intense as we go into the year 1974. Fuel prices are slamming independent truckers and owner operators. Plants are shutting down, and Fitzsimmons insists that there should be no support to the demands of these truckers, and he sends his own thugs, like literal McMaster thugs. Mm -hmm. after strikers who are wildcatting and blockaders uh, in addition to thugs sent from employers and mm -hmm. this leads to even more Mad Max like scenarios in what is ostensibly the most prosperous country in the capitalist world at the time yeah I mean remember the first Mad Max was kind of a pre-apocalyptic mm -hmm. right you know yeah. it was about the gas crisis and you know gas was getting very expensive and biker gangs were roaming around and causing problems for baby face Mel Gibson uh, and then, you know, society collapsed and you got the road warrior. But at first, yeah, it looked like this. It looked like, you know. It's definitely my favorite Mad Max besides Fury Road. Yeah. Yeah, the first one was good. As Moldea says, quote, like the Teamsters, the oil companies had their own hired guns. Armed members of the Hell's Angels motorcycle gang were paid by the Sohio, a subsidiary of the Standard Oil Company, to escort tanker trucks leaving refiners transport in Cleveland. Bellied up and jackknifed. 18 wheelers littered the roads all over the country. In New York, the Holland Tunnel was blockaded. In Pennsylvania, a bridge on the turnpike was bombed. Leaders from Overdrive, a Teamsters dissident faction, were shot at while holding Teamster goons at bay at the, quote, Battle of Breezewood, just off the turnpike. A driver hammering down in Delaware was shot and killed. Team driver's trucks became personal fortresses. Door handles were removed so assailants couldn't pull drivers in the streets for beatings. Windshields were taped to prevent injuries from flying glass. Drivers carried baseball bats, shivs, and guns. Not surprising that Hell's Angels came in on the side of the employers. Not surprising at all. Not surprising at all. And if you don't think they're capable of contract killing, well, like, there it is. It's contract, yeah. <laughs> contract strike breaking right there. Unemployment protests actually started breaking out in this country uh, as it went into recession for the first time, really since the Depression you had large-scale unemployment. And Hoffa, for his part at this time, begins going on TV and in the radio and saying in union gatherings and conferences that this was the thing that he predicted would happen. You know, as we said in the, in the first few episodes, Hoffa always believed that, you know, capitalism was great for him. He could sponge off it, but it was ultimately doomed and he mm -hmm. knew which side he would choose. Mm -hmm. And the reason that he believed that it had really fallen out is because you started seeing a large pool of unemployed, which in his view is the pool from which strike breakers and scabs come from. And this would force uh, driving down of wages and breaking of unions all over the country would force givebacks by employees and unions 
whether they were public employee unions or not, and that the only way to fight it, in Hoffa's view, was using the blockading and disrupting power of transportation workers in particular. Mm. The only way to kind of get out of that trap where a pool of unemployed is always used to keep down wages and benefits and force a kind of permanent state of disrespect is by using the power of trucks, Mm. longshoremen, and so on. And Hoffa's position in every interview that I've seen of him around this time is, and they ask him things about the New York financial crisis, Mm -hmm. where, you know, the the firefighters, the municipal workers, everyone were saying that they need to give give backs in order for this. He said, no, absolutely no give backs. Mm -hmm. There should be no cut or in conditions at all. And this wasn't just a a campaigning thing. He said, basically, if you give that back, you will never win it again. Yeah. Or it will be very, very hard to win again. And with this kind of a militant position here, amid this increasingly Mad Max-like world in which only truckers can save it, apparently, Hoffa's popularity would off the charts. Um, Overdrive magazine, that that dissident magazine, did a poll themselves of the Teamster members in 74, and they found that if there was a general election and just Teamster members could vote, 82% of the Teamsters would vote for Jimmy Hoffa to take the general presidency again. But, of course, Teamster members themselves don't vote for the president mm. at this time. Instead, it's a much more Byzantine game of trading of favors mm-hmm. and winning support of these regional guys. And it's worth talking about at this time that Fitzsimmons, for his part, had a lot of exposure, but somehow seemed to be protected against all odds. And I I don't mean that, I guess what I mean to say is that like this alliance with Nixon wasn't just an alliance with, of convenience. Mm-hmm. Fitzsimmons was, was fully protected. Yeah. Prosecutions of Fitzsimmons' son and Fitzsimmons himself arose starting at about 72, 73. But these prosecutions, these investigations by the FBI and the Department of Justice were made to go away as long as Fitz continued collaborating and the trucks kept moving. Mm. Uh, A 1973 wiretap application, for example, of the La Costa golf course and of Fitzsimmons and his associates was denied by the upper echelons of the Department of Justice. Mm. And this made the FBI agents investigating it so mad because it was so <laughs> clear that Fitzsimmons was just literally cutting deals with mafia yeah, people yeah. on the it's, course. Yeah, it's like the real, you know, the real people willing to fight this war getting sold out by the bureaucrats up top, just like Vietnam. <laughs> you know, the real, the real ones who are going after the communists, you know, because obviously all labor leaders are communists, uh, you know, and then they, you know, these patriotic FBI agents yeah. stabbed in the back by these bureaucrats. Yeah, but it, of course it wasn't bureaucrats. It was literally Nixon's people yeah. at the top because oh, yeah. they understood something that these FBI agents didn't, which right. is Fitz can violate the law all day yeah. as long as the inflation rate stays down. And as long as he doesn't allow Hoffa to undertake his uh, insurgency. Exactly. Grand jury proceedings against uh, Fitz's fail sons are also Mm. stopped by the Department of Justice. And all of this was on the orders of high-ranking DOJ officials and probably the Attorney General himself. So Fitzsimmons and others appear to be invulnerable to federal investigation. Note that for later, when Mm -hmm. Hoffa disappears. Mm -hmm. What restrictions are you under? At this moment, none. But what Hoffa apparently did not know was that there was a restriction. A deal had been made. Written into his release from prison was a provision that he could not return to power in the Teamsters. And he never did. Now, that restriction in Hoffa's prison release has become an important part of the government's investigation into Hoffa's disappearance. The questions being asked are, who arranged with the Nixon administration that Hoffa's release be written to keep him out of the Teamsters? 
And are they the same people who later arranged for Hoffa's disappearance? Federal investigators also want to question Teamster President Fitzsimmons about the arrangement to keep Hoffa out of the Union and about Hoffa's disappearance. But Justice Department officials in the Ford administration twice stopped investigators from calling Fitzsimmons before a federal grand jury. So, Peter, you asked earlier, how does Hoffa tend to get rid of this restriction? Yeah, his restriction Legally on speaking. participating in union activity until 1980. Yeah, because the president just kind of put that on there as part of the commutation power, mm -hmm. right? Well, Hoffa did what Hoffa often seems to do in these situations, which is he calls up a far-left attorney mm. with impeccable court skills. Hoffa's attorney... He called on this one is Leonard Boudin or Boudin. Is he related to Kathy Boudin? Leonard Boudin is Kathy Boudin's father and oh, Chester wow. Boudin's grandfather. Yeah, that's funny given that, you know, for those who don't know, uh, Kathy Boudin was a, was a militant leftist at the time, was a, was, I believe was in Weatherman, uh, Weather Underground, but definitely wound up fighting alongside the Black Liberation Army, got uh, right. Am I thinking the right one? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She was involved with the Brinks robbery, right? Yes. So she was involved in one of the most, you know, uh, notorious armed robberies. Uh, and that was relative. That was late. Right. This was after. Yeah, that was 81. Yeah, that was 81. And, you know, people don't quite remember how many of these militants were still around, even into the 80s. Um, and uh, uh, then Kesa, right. Is that his name? Chesa. Chesa. Chesa, yeah. Chesa was DA in San Francisco. Uh, and was, you know, a, a target for a lot of uh, spite from both the right and from, you know, NIMBY type liberals for his uh, being soft on crime, supposedly in San Francisco. Worth noting here that a lot of uh, usually liberal, more critics of the new left said it was all one big Oedipal rebellion um, against, uh, you know, these, these sons, against the, their fathers of the system. But in this case, uh, Kathy Boudin, uh, didn't, the, the Oedipal thing doesn't seem to be applying his... I don't know, I could see Leonard Boudin being like, this, this is left adventurism, Kathy. Right, yeah, yeah, I guess maybe in that sense. <laughs> yeah. And after all, you know, women, they, they're not supposed to have the Oedipus, they're supposed to have someone else. But in any <laughs> event, the idea that they're all just, uh, that they're all just, you know, playing out family dynamics is a way to kind of belittle the whole thing. So funny little tie back, Leonard Boudin was the first lawyer called by Julius Rosenberg oh, yeah. when he was locked up on his charges, mm. but he was already taking too many cases at the time okay. and had that off. Well, um, anyway, what, what, did all, what did all Lenny do for Hoffa? So Lenny at the time was probably one of the leading and most radical and therefore willing to see kind of things outside the box, uh, civil liberties attorneys at the time. And I got to say, a lot of people misunderstand the nature of Hoffa's legal argument as to why the restriction on him shouldn't apply. Mm. Uh, a lot of people say that, like, Hoffa claimed falsely that he didn't know about the restriction, and therefore it it, it, it shouldn't apply, because I didn't know about it when I, when I agreed to it. But ignorance of the law is no excuse, as we've often been told. So... Boudin actually had a kind of a two-part argument here. The first argument was that the president's power to control you by commuting your sentence isn't unlimited. Like, for example, we all kind of seem to intuitively know that if you're being held on a life sentence, you can't be pardoned on the by the president on the condition that you like wear a like a big banana suit 
and follow the president around as his personal servant at all times. Right. Right. You, you can't, can't just put whatever on there. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Actually. You, you can't pardon someone on the condition that they like donate all their money to the Richard Nixon yeah, Presidential yeah. Library. Right. We all know that there's some limitations on that. And the limitations that Boudin said you can put on were limitations on stuff that is protected by First Amendment freedom of association. Mm -hmm. You have the right to associate with people, to join various groups, to have speech and so on. And the president can't just take away one of those fundamental rights, mm -hmm. like being able to join a union or mm -hmm. join the, the ETA or whatever, association. Uh, by using their commutation power. Mm -hmm. The other argument, which is the more intriguing one in some ways, is that this commutation clause was the result of a corrupt bargain, mm -hmm. not struck by Hoffa, but by struck by other parties with the Nixon administration. Mm -hmm. And to kind of suss this out, um, Boudin deposed a lot of Nixon administration officials, but they could never get a deposition of Richard Nixon on this particular case. They deposed John Dean, they deposed Colson. And what they found out was that the original recommendation to commute off a sentence just recommended commuting off a sentence. It was just like, full stop, we examined the case and we examined the length of the sentence. Seems to be a little bit vindictive. This is from the Kennedys. Like, let's... Let's let this guy out. Hmm. That was the recommendation. And the original draft of the commutation didn't include a restriction. Hmm. However, after talking to Chuck Colson and, you know, as we now know is probably the case after receiving the payment for to get the restriction, then the language about the no serving in a union until 1980 was inserted in. Hmm. So in other words, you, the way that Boudin saw this and presented it was that this isn't just the president exerting his power. This is the product of bribery, mm. essentially. This is the product of a bargain, at least between, even if you don't take into account the actual money given, this is a result of a bargain between the president and Frank Fitzsimmons to help his friend, Frank Fitzsimmons, who, of course, then became one of the uh members of the re-elect committee to re-elect the president and its big union representative. Unfortunately, the uh, the when this argument was initially presented, it was struck down in a case called Hoffa v. Saxby, which said that the main problem here, in language that's very similar to U.S. v. Hoffa, that uh, bugging case, they said Hoffa accepted the bargain voluntarily. Mm -hmm. In other words, he saw this was going to be the condition and he had the opportunity to reject his commentation and stay in prison. I think that's kind of bullshit. Like, yes, he could have been like, no, I don't want to be released out of prison. But like, who accepts that? Right. Per Stephen Brill, the author of The Teamsters, in 1975, Fitzsimmons had his own personal attorney see if Hoffa's appeal from this decision stood a chance of success. And Fitzsimmons learned the bad news from his attorney that it did. Mm -hmm. It stood a high chance of success. A Department of Justice attorney, now that Richard Nixon was gone, who was interviewed by Brill, also recalled that the DOJ had drafted a memo evaluating Hoffa's lawsuit and stating that regardless of how the appeals court ruled, the DOJ should remove the restriction because in their view, Hoffa's attorneys were correct that it was an unconstitutional abuse of power by the big bad man, Richard Nixon, and they should remove the restriction regardless of how the federal appeals court or the Supreme Court rule. So here we are in 1975 and Hoffa's appeal is pending before the federal appeals court. And at this point, there's a very real threat that Hoffa could return to the general presidency at the next election in 1976, just in time for the 1976 renegotiation of that big nationwide national master freight agreement that would decide wages and benefits for all trucking in the country. Hoffa himself said in an interview that he didn't even think Fitzsimmons or Fitzsimmons' allies, like Roy Williams, that kind of generic white guy put in place by the mafia, mm -hmm would even be in the running for the general presidency. Everything Fitzsimmons and the local barons had and had gained in these years in the 1970s was contingent on himself 
and its allies like Jackie Presser and Roy Williams retaining control and continuing to deliver on their end mm -hmm. of a bargain, not just with Richard Nixon, but with every owner and employer yes. that the, the trucks would not drive up the costs. Mm -hmm. to, to combat the falling rate of profit yeah uh that had you know I, I know people i know people say that we've disproved marx's uh uh prediction of the rate of general rate of profit to fall but it seemed to be kind of looking uh, that way that mm. certainly didn't look that way in 1975 yeah. yeah but this everything they had and everything they were gaining relied on continuing to sell side deals on continuing to make loans from the pension fund and it, it wasn't even just that Fitzsimmons' continued immunity from prosecution, it seemed like on all these loan schemes and all the shit his son was mixed up in, also depended on not making trouble. Mm -hmm. The continued streams of money from truck leasing and sweetheart deal bribes to Tony Provenzano and kickbacks going to the center of the Teamsters Union also depended on not bringing those trucking companies in line with the National Master Freight Agreement. In other words, it depended on still acting as a kind of like Vichy occupation government for the employers, the Teamsters yeah. Union. And finally, it fits his own ability to just keep a salary for himself and mm -hmm. his sons and his flunkies and everyone else he put into position, dependent on obviously not losing the general presidency. Because the, the presidency kind of has the power to sustain itself yes. unless something from outside using kind of the boodling and whatever, unless somebody from outside is able to disrupt it, which somebody like Hoffa could do. And perhaps is the only one who right. can at this time. Yeah. Now, taking out Hoffa, however, uh, seems to be a problem. Mm. <laughs> at this point, four years of attempts by an intimidation and terror, literally four years of these like shootings, bombings, and so yeah. on, by McMaster and his goons had not work the Hoffa people in 299 like Pete Camrata were madder than ever and had built up a campaign now, war chest had the fighting gone much outside of 299 I know there was a Mad Max stuff between the companies and the Wildcats but so my understanding is 299 was was important in large part because Hoffa would need to rejoin a union and also become a union president, right? A yes. local president in order to become general president. Correct. You couldn't just run for general president as a rank and file guy. Is that correct? I believe you could run for president if you were an officer and nominated, but not as a rank and file guy. Okay, yeah. Because so, that went by much later on in 81, Pete Camarada runs for president. Right. So it's like the seizure of like... It's a strategic point. Yes, it, I would say it's it's Easter. like his strategic sanctuary, you know? Yeah, he needs to get back to Rome so he can collect, uh, you know, bring all the legions. Exactly. More importantly than all these attempts against Hoffa not working was Hoffa was offering the army, as he referred to your average teamster, the, the petty officers and so on. He was offering them kind of like a war presidency. Yeah, the, he saw that like the the economic apocalypse is here. Mm -hmm. He believed that it would happen that there would be another depression that he would be back out fighting on the streets, blocking off roads with trucks, blocking depots, and there will be no more deals, no more givebacks, and he would be fighting their wages even if it meant shutting the country down, buck the inflation rate. Right. So by that point, how long had Hoffa been out by seventy five? By 75, he had been out for eight years. Eight years? Eight years. He went to jail in No, 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 no. I mean out of prison. Oh, by that point, he'd been out of prison for uh, going on four years. So in that time, I guess what he was mostly doing was kind of seeing Teamsters, giving interviews. Yes. Like that's how he, he was, was basically mostly... like constantly campaigning. Yes. Okay. And yeah. his people in Detroit were also building a war chest. Like, yes. Uh, like Camarada. Yes. As he said to an interviewer, and uh, this was for a book called Hoffa, The Real Story, that the original transcript got leaked, quote, they all know I'm back, very much back, and that I will be the general president again come hell or high water. I'm not a guy who believes in limited warfare, so the rats better start jumping the ship. Oh, damn. People keep asking if I'm back, and I haven't really had an answer. But now, yeah. I'm thinking I'm back. That's like that's like a it's like a really good wrestling promo. <laughs>
No, it's more serious than that, folks. More what serious. are you going to do when Hoffa Mania comes down on you? <laughs> yeah, what are you going to Well, we found out. Yeah, well, we found out. It was unfortunate. Yeah. We won't skip ahead to that, though. Yeah. So, so what, what's, a, what's a Fitzsimmons to do? Well, here's the thing. There is also one character that we're kind of giving short shrift as Hoffa is getting more and more uh, unstable in oh, Fitzsimmons. Is that what they're saying? View. According to Jack Goldsmith, this is the time period in which Chucky O'Brien, Hoffa's adopted son, says Fitzsimmons and others were approaching Hoffa through intermediaries like mutual friend and Detroit Mafia associate Tony Jackaloni with like eye-watering offers of mm. money and influence. They were offering him directorships of corporations. They were offering him lifetime pensions. In, and we're talking in the millions of dollars. And, you know, he was just a simple crook. So obviously he took it, right? Oh, he was there. He was offering this to not be to not, to stop running for general president. Correct. And being a simple crook, presumably he took it. And he did not take any of it. Oh, whoa! They asked him just if you please give up the quest to reclaim the general presidency, you could have all of this. And he said, "Not today, Satan." Um, mm. Hoffa turned the promises from Jackaloni down, but he kept talking. And there was an insinuation by Jackaloni who O'Brien, again, considered Uncle Tony and his, quote, other father, that Hoffa was crazy to check, turn these down. He mm -hmm. just wasn't seeing the big picture here. Right, he was unstable. Yeah, it, it's interesting, like, the logic here was just, you're unstable if you care about your members. Right, yeah, if you don't take this crooked deal. If you don't just sell them all out. Yeah. Like, I... <laughs> O'Brien, pointedly, was cut off by Hoffa during this time. And specifically, he asked Hoffa for continuing bailouts on his debts for mm. you know, gambling and whoring around. Mm -hmm. And Hoffa said, no more payoffs. And at least a decent amount of these debts were owed to Tony Giacalone mm. by Chucky O'Brien. Right. So he was expecting, he was expecting a payout if, uh, if Jimmy took it, took the deal. I, I, what I'm trying to say here, I guess, is O'Brien, at the same time that he's hearing that Hoff is being offered all these deals, right, still owes a lot of money to yeah. people, including Tony Giacalone. And he asks Hoffa to pay off these debts for him. Right. And as he did many times before. And Hoffa said no and cut off Chucky okay. O'Brien. I, I, I guess I was just projecting, like, you know, presumably O'Brien thought that if Hoffa did take the deal... He'd have so much money sloshing around that, you know, he could then pay off. He might have, but it was out of the picture because okay. uh, Jimmy was acting too on stage. Yeah. yeah. And maybe, but I, and I was also going to say that maybe Jack Aloni thought the same thing. Probably. Probably. So, not coincidentally, uh, O'Brien, who was previously Hoffa's ride or die, he was the guy who beat up his would be <laughs> Sam yeah. um, in the months leading up to Hoffa's appearance, began to cut him off from contact and uh, act hold. In his estimation, Hoffa was acting crazy and O'Brien began to even spread a rumor that Hoffa was or was about to turn into a government witness and Jimmy was a rat. And the rumor by itself would have probably produced terror and conformity from anyone who has legal exposure because of all the loans, extortions, mafia relationships and so on. Their thought was that Hoffa must be trading Teamster secrets to the feds in order to have his restriction on union activity removed. Uh, now, it, it should be noted that like there was actually no evidence that Hoffa ever right. made this offer to turn into a government witness. Uh, and, and the source of that appears to be O'Brien. The source it, of that, yes, like, it appears to be O'Brien, yeah. Yeah, okay. And it appears to be that O'Brien started that rumor at the time that Hoffa oh, cut him off. And in which he really was financially vulnerable, shall mm. we say, and financially very much in a place to accept offers from, say, Uncle Tony. Mm. Now, in the spring and early summer of 1975, Hoffa received some final warnings from the Teamster leadership and others. Sometime in March or April of 1975, a message was given to Vice President and Hoffa ally, really the only Hoffa ally in the leadership of the Teamsters, Harold Gibbons. And the message, according to Stephen Brill, was simple. Stop or else. 
One Teamsters vice president who was golfing with other Fitzsimmons allies at La Costa in California remembered that it was around this time in spring of 1975 that rumors went around that soon the, quote, Hoffa problem would be taken care of. The coming purge of the Hoffa presidency wouldn't be coming. Rats didn't have to leave the ship. Yeah, so you, you have to figure in that in that situation that Fitzsimmons uh, would probably be thinking, well, you know, I need to, I mean, along with dealing with the Hoffa problem, like if he doesn't deal with it promptly, that some of those barons that he relies on might be thinking, well, Hoffa might win this thing, so better get, well, the getting's good. Yeah. On his side. Exactly. Around this time, so we're in spring and early summer of 75. Keep in mind also July 30th, 1975 is when Hoffa disappears. Around this time, Anthony, nicknamed Tony Jack, Jack Loney, that's Uncle Tony, in phone calls and in meetings in lawyers' offices, tried to set up a meeting between Hoffa himself and New Jersey leader and mafia capo, who we love, Tony Provenzano, for what was described as a peace meeting. If the two could squash their uh, prison beef and maybe throw in the promise of a loan, perhaps Tony Provenzano would give his sign off to a new Hoffa presidency. At least that what, was the what deal. Construction was the loan going in from the Teamsters, generally out yep. to Tony Provenzano okay. Associates. Yes, this prison beef has been given a lot of um, a lot of press, but as far as I could tell, in '67. They had a fight in prison where Tony Provenzano was angry with Hoffa because Hoffa wouldn't intercede on his behalf mm. to get himself uh, a union pension while he was sitting in prison. Right. Which uh, is not normally how it works with pensions, right? You don't get your pension piece. You went to jail. You get your pension piece. You retire. Like, how is it supposed to work? Anything's possible with the Teamsters at the right, time. Yeah, yeah. But Hoffa said that he couldn't do anything Hands were tied, didn't have any power. In all probability, it was something like he didn't want to be associated with this guy anymore. Yeah. Because um, certainly the alliance didn't help him. Right. Yeah, if somebody else wound up in charge of that local, then maybe he'd have more control over it. But uh, according to Jack Goldsmith, this prison beef was, and frankly, even the FBI files in this case, the prison beef was at best pretextual. This was right. really about whether they're kind of freeze could mm. be thawed and Tony Provenzano could at least be neutralized and not oppose a Hoffa presidency. Yeah. When right now he was a strict Fitzsimmons ally. Mm. Hoffa rejected the first two offers at a peace meeting with Provenzano. He wasn't trying to get Provenzano's support. Mm. Two weeks before Hoffa disappears, an FBI informant planted the La Costa Golf Club where Fitzsimmons loves to be, overheard a high-ranking Teamster vice president repeating that soon Hoffa would be, quote, disposed of. And with even family seeming to desert him, and just as he was becoming more popular than ever, with warnings passed, Hoffa could feel the impending threat. Mm. He started changing his entire routine. So where his plans usually, and his movements would be kept entirely secret, and he wanted to be totally unpredictable and traveled alone frequently. Now he began to tell his wife, his friends, and everyone around exactly where he was going, who he was meeting with, and tried repeatedly to get others to come with him to any meeting he was going in on. But on July 30th, 1975, third time is a charm, and he agreed to Tony Jack, Tony Jack Loney's third offer for a peace meeting with Tony Provenzano. Mm. He wouldn't come back. And on that happy note, listeners, till next time. All right.